I'll go Robertson, O'Donnell, Christie, Armstrong and Dykes. That should be 11 that should beat England, no problem. We'd take six security guards with us, four would walk around Bex and two for the rest of us. And I just went like that, nanu, nanu, then he done it back. But you should have seen the look on Peter Reid's face. He was looking, <laughs> what the hell is going on here? Yes, hello and a very warm welcome to this, the bookmakers.co.uk Euro 2020 preview in association with Tony Bet. I'm your host, Tom Lee, and it gives me nothing but the utmost pleasure uh, to introduce to you our panel of experts to help us walk through uh, the summer's golden ticket, a wonderful month of football upcoming. Uh, so without further ado, first up, in the red corner, Liverpool FC's all-time leading goal scorer, a man who is the author of 28 international goals. Welcome, Mr Ian Rush. Hi. Great to have you on board, Ian, and particularly with Wales going so well under Robert Page. Looking forward to getting your insight. Uh, I will be back to you momentarily. But next up, in the Tartan corner, a man who not only was a champion in his native Scotland, uh, but also conquered the Bundesliga with Germany. Uh, he loves his golf. He loves his horse racing. Welcome, Alan McAnally. Hi, everybody. Come on, the mighty Scots. Come on, the mighty Scots. We will be getting into this in some more depth, Alan. And last but not least, in case those two can't deliver in front of goal, imagine <laughs> being able to call upon a man who made 516 Premier League appearances. And not just that, he was called up for four international tournament squads. Great to have you on board, Emil Heskey. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, what a team, what a lineup we've got here for this bookmakers.co.uk Euro 2020 preview. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, Tony Bet. Thanks for you guys for being on board. Let's dive straight in because there's a lot to go at here. Um, I'm just going to take a stab at this and say, Alan McAnally, I'm going to consult you first, if I may, please. Scotland. Mm -hmm. Ten times they've been to the well in an international tournament. They've never made it out the group stage. They're the penalty kings. They've done something remarkable by creeping into this tournament. Is it a triumph in itself that they've made it through? Are they just there for the ride or are they to be taken seriously? How do you assess the Scots and their, their squad and their chances this time around? Well, first and foremost, I have to say that I was one of the players who didn't manage us to get us out of the group in 1990 World Cup. So I apologise to all the Scottish, Scottish viewers. Uh, and I thought that was going to be our best chance and we, we didn't do it and we didn't qualify since 1988. We're definitely not there to make up the, the, up the, um, up the, the, the numbers, for sure. Um, I think we've got a good group as well. I think it's a realistic group that we could um, get to the next stage. And this might be the first time that these lads can say we got our nation out of a group. Yeah, we did get in the back door, didn't we? We didn't play particularly well for a good year and a half. And Stevie Clark took time to try and get a club mentality. We don't have superstars. We don't really have any superstars. I mean, you may think with Tierney and Robertson, we have one of the best left flanks in the group stages. We really do. Both are international football players. Both are at the top level in, uh, domestically. Um, but there is absolutely no chance we are there to make up the pieces. I'll be really disappointed if we don't uh, go out our group with England into the group stages for sure, or the, or the knockout stages rather. Well, that in itself is contentious because I'd say there are a few Scotland fans saying, why can't Scotland get out of this group with Croatia, who, lest we forget, three years ago in the World Cup, eliminated England. So that's another talking point entirely. Um, Scotland 11 to 10 pre-tournament with Tony Beck to qualify from Group D. I personally mm -hmm. don't think that's beyond a pale in any way, shape or form. Um, you're the expert, though. When you look at that and you assess particularly the exciting talents you've got. And I'm talking now about, in my own mind, I'm looking at youngsters like Billy Gilmore. I'm looking at maturing mm. players like Scott McTominay, who's been so good for Manchester United in, a, I guess, an improving team, but not a finished article. I'm talking about a youngster like Lyndon Dykes. I'm talking about a goal scorer, a predator like John McGinn. Who are you mm. excited to see? And who do you think really is going to light up the well, stage and perhaps be the, the big ticket? Yeah, all them, Tom, to be honest, I'm going to throw Kevin Nisbet in as well, who got a goal against Holland the other night there. I mean, we, we are a maturing group. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And we're actually, I think, with the, 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 the um, performances we've had and the results we've had are really encouraging. Now, listen, 
You mentioned Lyndon Dykes. Lyndon Dykes is a, was born in Australia. I think it was Queensland. Comes over, a kind of rugby league background from the family. Ends up at Queen of the South in Dumfries. Goes to Livingston, gets to QPR, and he's an international football player. So talking about round the houses, and it's not that we're absolutely relying on him, but you forget about Shea Adams. You're right, you know, who's, who's going to be playing for us now. Um, and the, obviously John McGinn... Uh, the, but the McGinn thing, I want to see Stevie Clark play McGinn a little bit further forward, not just play McGinn and McTominay as a two in the middle of the park. But we have players who can definitely, you know, trouble, de- genuinely trouble. I think Stuart Armstrong's had a good season at Southampton. And like I say, with Robertson and Tierney down the left-hand side, we've been pretty good. And Jack Kennedy, one of our centre-halves, I would imagine we'll probably play with a three at the back. I think that'll suit us better with Grant Hanley in the middle. But in terms of a superstar for us, I'm going to, I'm genuinely going to go for, for Robertson down the left-hand flank. If he can create chances for us, then I think Lyndon and Armstrong and Nisbet and McGinn will get us goals where we want to be, which is the knockout stages. Well, Alan, you've almost preempted it there. So give me an idea, sort of a rough, rough draft, if Pablo Picasso could pull out his sketch pad and make a mm. perfect starting eleven for Scotland to go into this tournament with. Uh, if you're Steve Clark and you're sitting there thinking, OK, some people are going to be disappointed. Some people may be pleasantly surprised. Uh, mm. But if you're in charge of selection, who do you send out, for example, against England on the 13th? Um, I, I, go th- I, go, I go with the wing backs and the three uh, central defenders with... Um, I had written this down as well. I can't remember what I did with it. I'm going to go Henry, certainly. Hanley. And possibly Tierney as a, as a left-sided, although... Yeah, Tierney as a left um, and Henry as a right and Hanley as a middle. And I'll go Robertson in one side and I'll probably go Stephen O'Donnell uh, on the right-hand side. But I think he'll play McGinn and McTominay. I think he'll play both of those guys against England. I really do. That's not a negative thing because we're looking for McGinn to get forward. And I think he'll play Dykes and Christie. Uh, and I think he'll play Stuart Armstrong as well. And I think that'll be our game. So I'll go Tierney, Hanley, Jack Hendry. I'll go McGinn McTominay. I'll go Robertson O'Donnell, Christie, Armstrong, and Dykes. That should be 11 that should beat England, no problem. Well, that Friday night is going to be some occasion. I tell you what, <laughs> it's not the 13th, it's the 18th. I wanted to say Friday the 13th, but Friday the 18th is, is a date that should be writ large in sport, sporting fans' minds because that is going to be a very, very special occasion. Uh, what I will say is that that in itself, Scotland, England, that rivalry, the reignition of that to every Scotsman, that mm. must just, just make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, Alan. Yeah, everybody's talking about. It. I mean, everybody in England are looking forward to it as well, aren't they? It's a it's a fixture that um, when we were all younger, there was the home nations, etc. And I can remember going to Wembley with my dad, and then obviously going to Hamden with my mates when the game was up in Scotland, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I actually got well, I didn't get to play because Roxburgh I didn't play me. He was on the bench. We played England at Hamden, and it was when Stevie Bull Billy scored two goals that day. Uh, Saturday afternoon at Wembley, it would have been 1990. Was it? I think it might have been before the World Cup, maybe in '89, and it was absolutely unbelievable. The, 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 the just just the weight for it is unbelievable, and I think the factor is even higher now because we don't have it all the time. And if we can get a good result against the Czech Republic first, and then head to Wembley, wow. It'll be absolutely amazing. It'll be, and I'm sure Emil and, and everybody he's spoken to are really looking forward to this because obviously they'll be thinking we can turn them over. But I think we might just surprise a few people, hopefully. And um, like I say, and, and you, you spoke about Croatia prior to, I'm saying that hopefully we can get out of the group stages. They're not the Croatia of the runners-up in the World Cup a few years ago. They're not that Croatia anymore. And I genuinely think we have an outstanding chance to go through to the, 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 um, the knockout stages with England. I really do. Well, Alan, thank you for now. Uh, you just mentioned Emil. I'll bring you in, please, Emil, because uh, with your England hat on, uh, you look at this and you say, wow, what an opportunity for England to come into this space. Joint favourites for the tournament before it begins. And you look at this group and you say to yourself, Czech Republic, Croatia, Scotland, on the face of it, Emil Heskey, uh, this looks, to me at least, like a group that England ought to be at least having strong ambitions to be winning. Would you agree? I think going into any tournament, England has a strong strong ambition to, to win the tournament. Um, there's a lot of pressure on, on the England sides going into tournaments. 
and this is the, exactly the same. Um, as you look at the as you look at the um, the group, yeah, we we would like to think we should to, we should be topping that group. But as Alan was talking there, these games are not easy. Um, the Scotland game, I was lucky enough to play in the Scotland game. Um, in a qualifier, we actually lost that game at Wembley. I think it was Don Hutchinson scored a header, um, but we actually uh, uh, snuck through um, on the away goal. So they're never going to be easy. You got to throw, you got to throw um, uh, all form out of the window because everyone, they, 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 both teams want to win, and it's going to be a huge, huge battle. But going back to actually being top of the of the table, yeah. Is one hundred percent is something that um, England are going to be looking at and want to be achieving. MOU, of course, had vast experience of major international tournaments, um, and you've been through the ringer in terms, I guess, of the the nerves and the anticipation around about selection. But you've seen this squad that's been unveiled this week, and yes, there's been a lot of chat about how many fullbacks have been picked, particularly on the right. Yes, there's been a lot of chat about certain players missing. Mm-hmm. Uh, who were you pleased? And I guess also disappointed uh, when you saw names both included and omitted. What did you make of that squad selection? Look, I think one of the toughest jobs is is for a national team, um, especially when you've got so many good players. And then one thing you've got to do is fit the players in and have have good balance. Uh, having four fullbacks was a little bit strange for me because, again, I thought that you could have had uh, probably a few more attacking players taking one of, one, one of the fullbacks out and having a few more attacking players. Um, again, taking players that are not fit. I've been in, I've been in an environment um, where we've taken uh, David Beckham, which is probably a different, a different scenario in a sense that he was our captain and he's our talisman and he was our real proper leader in this, uh, taking us into a tournament and he wasn't fully fit. Um, so picking players when they're not fully fit and not picking players when... They've had probably the season of their life when you're looking at Jesse Lingard. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Taking uh, West Ham to heights that you probably wouldn't have even foreseen um, uh, 12 months ago. And scoring goals that you didn't realise that he had it in him. But just enjoying his football. And this is one thing when you're going into actually tournaments and at the end of a season, you want to be picking people on, on their performances, on our merit. And this is where you have a real, real balancing act when you're a manager. Do you pick someone on the fact that you know that you can achieve, you know that you can do this, but he hasn't really done it for the last couple of months? Or do you pick someone who's actually done it for the last couple of months and you know that he's in rich vein of form? Of course. So if you're disappointed to see Lingard omitted, which I think lots of us share those sentiments after the campaign he's had that you highlighted, um, who are you pleased to see included? Who do you think are the real threats? Who actually excites you? When you look at that squad of players at the disposal of Gareth Southgate and his coaches, who do you think is going to light up those games? Who would you be looking at to really get on the ball and make things happen? When you, when you look at the season that uh, Phil Foden has had, I think he's, he's, he is fantastic. Um, I don't think there's anything he can't do. I've seen him play a false number nine and I thought he was very, very good at doing that. Um, but again, that's with a, with a group of players that understand the way that, it's going to be, the way that the structure is going to be worked on. Mason Mount has had an absolutely fabulous uh, season. Uh, considering the criticism that he's had when Frank was in charge and et cetera, to come out the way that he has and be a mainstay and be a real real talisman in that team in a, in a big club is fantastic. And Jack Grealish is coming back. We all know what Jack Grealish can do. Um, we all know what he's capable of. But having him there and actually going out and having, having the opportunity to call upon someone like that is fantastic. Thank you, Emil. So let's just say in your mind's eye, um, it is the first game of Euro 2020. You're 48 hours out from the game. You're sitting with Gareth Southgate. He says, Emil, I am stumped. I am really stumped here. I'm trying to pick a starting 11. I've got options left, right and centre. Just give me your sequence, your chain of events that says, here's 11 players uh, who are going to walk out of that tunnel and who are going to win that opening fixture. Uh, what is your starting lineup for for this summer's uh, really international to tournament? It's tough, but <laughs> I'm really going to throw it on me now. Um, you need 14 players, Emil. Yeah, I know. Uh, back four, obviously, I, I, I'd, I'd go with Pickford. Um, you would go Jordan Pickford, yeah? yeah? I, I, I Interesting. Would, yeah, I would go with Pickford. Um, I would. Uh, oh, this is interesting. 
I actually quite like uh, Reese James at right back. I think he's he's very versatile. He's very very powerful young lad. Doesn't really get done on one one v ones. Great uh, game in the Champions League final. Yeah, Brilliant game. Yeah, fantastic. Um, centre backs. Stones. Oh, you really do me. Let's go left back, Chilwell. Um, I actually like the balance of Tyrone's Mings, but I, I, I would probably. Maguire's not fit, is he? Question mark, but probably not. Yeah. I tell you what, I'm going to go Stones and uh, Kyle Walker. Um, again, playing together at club level helps, I think, at times, so you have a, a better understanding. And I think that's why he um, picked so many. So many right backs because again he can actually tuck inside um, when 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 called upon. Um, so we're going three or four in midfield. I'm going to go three. I'm going to go three, and I'm going to have Declan Rice holding. Um, I don't think Henderson's fit, and I don't think Calvin Phillips is fully fit right now, is he? Um, if Calvin Phillips is is fit, I'll go with two holding. Um, but if Calvin Phillips is not fit, I'll go with one holding. Obviously, Declan Rice. I'll go with Grealish in front of that, and then I'll go Foden, Mount, and then Harry Kane. Fascinating. A lot of young players and Jack Grealish, who uh, is perhaps the wild card player who can Still make Still young, it. though, Jack. Oh, listen, a, a special player, a mercurial talent. Emil, thank you for now. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we will revisit uh, a few angles from both Alan and Emil momentarily. However... Ian Rush, we cannot leave you out in the cold for too much longer, sitting in a very comfy-looking armchair, purring <laughs> with satisfaction at a Welsh team under Robert Page, who, yeah, I would say, Ian, it's been a little bit of um, a volatile build-up with the, some of the, the background noise about Robert Page having to come in in that caretaker role. Uh, Wales are outsiders for Group A, understandably, because Italy have been so strong in qualifying, and yet they're there on merit, Will they, despite their lofty odds, uh, either win that group? Probably not, unless you tell me otherwise. Can they escape from Group A? Yes, I think they can escape. I think uh, when you look at uh, Italy, your favourites to win the group, we all know that. But when you look at Switzerland and Turkey, I think uh, I'm add Wales to that. And I think any one of them three can qualify. I think it's uh, after Italy, any of these three teams uh, can qualify. In. And I would expect Wales to qualify. Uh, you know, Rob Page has done a good job. He's brought Kit Simons in as well. But uh, I think the attack inside of Wales um, could be the difference. And uh, I'm really, really looking forward to, to Wales playing these games. And they've got a bit of experience after 2016 Euros. So um, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to uh, seeing this attack inside for Wales. That's fascinating because you're in effect telling me that you firmly believe Wales will be taking points off Certainly Switzerland, certainly Turkey, if you, th if you expect them. Not just it's a chance, you expect them to qualify from Group A. Those are strong words. Yes, because the last game is Italy and we know uh, we're in a position then. Hopefully we're in a position to, uh, to know what we need against Italy. So normally they say when you go into this group, don't lose your first game. I'm looking, Wales are playing Switzerland and I, I would be looking, win this first game. Then you'll be getting to the last game where if you win, you can still qualify. So I would, I would say... The, most probably the opposite this time. I think Wales have got to go and take the game to Switzerland. And I think they can do that. They've got the attacking players to do that. And I think if they get three points there, you know, I think they, they can easily qualify. Despite the amazing progress that they made, made in the Euros of 2016, why do they just not get the credit they deserve? They don't seem to get enough respect, this Welsh team. Because they're Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what it is and uh, that's what it's all about we have to bring <laughs> Wales to Europe and make, make them sure we got to the semi-finals of the Euros 2016 so we have to start making a name for ourselves now and I think with the players the young players that we got and the experienced players that we have I think we can actually do that but you only do that by winning games at Euros Right, talk to me about those players because on the one on the one hand you've got the the multiple Champions League winning flag bearer that is Gareth Bale. Is he as good as he was? On the other side, you've got this wonderful young player, Ethan Ampadu, who's only, what, 20 years of age. He's been playing really well on loan in a struggling team. And in between that, you've got some really experienced and exciting pros. How do you assess that group of players, Ian? 
I think they're they're a great group of players, and I think that's why I think they've got the experience now with the young players. And uh, like I keep looking at it, this, um, I watched Daniel James play uh, with um, Bale against the Czech Republic, and you look at the goal that he scored there. The the combination that they have there was up. No, it, it's called the football brain. They know what they're doing, and add Aaron Ramsey to that. I would put Aaron Ramsey as a, like a false number nine, and I would have James Bale and Ramsey. And that is some attacking force. And they all know how to play football. They all have the football brain. And one thing I, with them free playing, I would guarantee chances. Guaranteeing chances. Just give me a line on Ampadu because, as I say, he's a kid. I mean, he's, he's, he's green, he's raw, he's wet behind the ears. But boy, can he play. Do you like him? Yes. Uh, I'm the elite performance director of the Welsh FA Trust. I had him when he's 14, 15 years old. And he stood out then when he was at Exeter. He stood out then and he's he's grown into a man now. And uh, I think with him, and you've got Joe Allen with his experience, them two old in midfield, I think, you know, you've got a, a quite tight midfield. And Ampadu has done absolutely fantastic this year. I put the squeeze on no less than an international uh, behemoth like Emil Heskey and forced him, bullied him into p- picking his strongest first 11. Uh, he didn't run screaming for the fields. He said, no problem. And he, he named a fantastic potential starting lineup for England. So same conundrum for you with a Welsh shirt on, Ian. Uh, for the opening fixture, who would you like Mr Page to be picking if you had a little bit of influence there to say, look, this is my opinion. I think this is a team that will get us three points in the opener. Well, you're looking, you're looking at the opposition you're playing against. I'm mean, yes. Switzerland, so I'm, I would say... For me, I would go and attack him to try and win the game. I would play Hennessy in goal if fit, if not Danny Ward. But if Hennessy's fit because he's had experience of the Euro 2016, you know, then then you're looking at you got Mempum, then Royden, Ben Davis. I, I think they'll play three four three. So you got them. Then you've actually got um, Connor Roberts, Ampadu, Allen, and I would go maybe Nico Williams on the on the left hand side instead of Reese, uh, because he can get up and down. But the most important thing, then you've got Bale, James and Ramsey. So at that, at, I, let, I would say them three, you do what you want because they can play and the others have to be well organised. Until last night, until they lost to France, Wales have not let men, conceded many goals. And I think they'll be trying to put a lot onto that. Keep it tight at the back because you know, the, we know these three can score goals. That, that warm-up result against France is irrelevant, isn't it? That's just something to, to give the players a run out, find a little bit of co- cohesion and coherence, a little bit of fluidity in the squad. They wouldn't be in any way concerned about that, would they? No, they wouldn't be. They're playing the world champions as well. And when you go down to 10 men, it's, it's always going to be difficult and all that. But uh, I think it's an experience for them. And I think they'll learn from that. And uh, it's all basically just getting ready for the first game. And uh, like I say, normally teams say, don't lose the first game. But I would be going for Wales saying you're playing Switzerland. You're not playing Italy. You're not playing France. You're playing Switzerland, a team where you can beat if you have the confidence to go out there and do it. Excellent stuff. Thank you, Ian. Right. Thinking caps on, please, gentlemen. Uh, in the same order as we span through that first section, I would like some selections, some picks from you, please. Uh, Alan McAnally, mm-hmm. you famously were part of a deadly front three. Mo Johnston, Brian McClare, Alan McAnally, goals left, mm. right and centre. So, can you hit the target and tell me, this far out, who will win Euro 2020? Uh, I, I, I don't think there'll be like a, you know, like a hundred to one outside or whoever may, may that be in the, in the betting. I think it's going to be down to France and Belgium and maybe, I've got a sneaky feeling that Spain might be there or thereabouts. So, but and, and I'd, I'd written this. I mean, I mean France: Benzema, Dembele, Griezmann, Mbappe, Turam. Goals! Oh my God! Goals! Romelu Lukaku, Tielemans, Witzel. I mean, I mean, Dries Mertens, Torgan Hazard, De Bruyne. I'll go Belgium. I'll go Belgium to win. I think, and, and I'll probably throw that. And you're probably going to ask as well, but I cannot see. With the season he's had, I think he got 24 goals with Inter, won the league. He's probably scored over 30 goals club and country this season, and Lukaku's got to be there and thereabouts the top goal scorer. But I just think this might be the year for Belgium. They missed out the last time, but in the Euros they have been just so strong. I'm going to go Belgium. 
Well, it's a great answer because, of course, if you work on the FIFA rankings, they're the top rated team, not just in Europe, oh. in the world. And of course, you mentioned the season that Lukaku's had. Now there's transfer speculation about him maybe going to Manchester City, maybe going to Chelsea. Uh, he's second favourite to be top goal scorer. So you're saying Belgium, Lukaku. I'm going to come back yeah. to them one more. Have a little think about a charity selection. Don't give it to me yet. We will round okay. off this section with your charity selection. But okay. I'm going to I'm going to put the squeeze on you in a minute. But you say Belgium, Lukaku. Uh, Mr. Emil yeah. Heskey, same question to you, if I may, please. Who will win the Euros this summer and who will be the top goal scorer in the tournaments? Again, like Alan said there, I I swing more towards Belgium because, again, for the last few years, this team has been together. Uh, They've been playing together for a long time now. That is actually now they have this cohesion and they've been threatening for a while to be that team in a tournament. I feel they've got, got it just about right now. Um, hopefully De Bruyne will be okay for the tournament because again you want to see the best players in the tournament so hopefully he'll be he'll be okay for the tournament and it's difficult to look past it's difficult to look past um, a a, a Belgium side that is so powerful so strong with the likes of Lukaku who doesn't get the just rewards to be honest with you Um, you look at the, the seasons that he's had over the years and he keeps progressing, getting bigger, better, stronger, quicker, scoring more goals, different types of goals. And I think they want their, their very, very powerful side. So I'll say them for, for winning it. Um, I might go for someone like Mbappe for, because, again, when you're looking at someone like him who's, again, had a, f- a fantastic uh, season, just he's unstoppable. And when you and and we all know when you're when you're at a, a young age like he is and you're playing the way he is, you feel you feel unstoppable. And I think he'll be going into this tournament thinking that no one can get near him, and he'll want to go and prove that. So I'm going to go for someone like Mbappe being the top goal scorer. Uh, great pick. What what a player. Um, graceful, but what an athlete and what a goal scorer. Quite frankly. So just to summarise, Alan says Belgium, Lukaku. You're saying Belgium but Mbappe, top goal scorer. Um, Ian Rush, surely we can't have a hat-trick of pundits, experts and ex-pros all teaming up saying the Belgians are going to win the Euros. Tell me something different or tell me that the lads have got it absolutely spot on and that the Red Devils of Belgium will indeed finally be proving they're a golden generation. What are we saying? Winner of Euro 2020. Well, I'm going to just echo what the lads have said, really. Because oh, no. <laughs> Belgium will not win it now. <laughs> Emil, I want to change my mind. No, if Belgium don't win it now, they'll never win it. That's what I look at it. No, they're all, they're absolutely fantastic. Um, no, I think it's wide open. I think it's the best chance Belgium had. You know, I think the dark horses are Italy. I think they are the dark horses. They can produce their, look at qualification. I think they're Unbeaten they're in qualifying. Yeah, so I think uh, I think they're the dark horses because they can produce when needed. If you can only have one. If I just give you one selection and, <laughs> and you're... Your, well, your... I can't. I'd like to say Belgium because uh, uh, both uh, Maka and Emil have said it. I'm going to have to do something different now. So <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to go for Italy now. <laughs> but Forza Italia, lovely. So Rush is saying Italy, um, top goal scorer for the tournament because uh, when you work through that that list, I mean, you've got the, the kind of the, the candidates that stand out: Harry Kane, Romelu Lukaku, Kylian Mbappe, Cristiano Ronaldo, getting on a bit but deadly. Uh, I've seen Memphis Depay mentioned, Karim Benzema back in the international fold, Chiro Immobile, who's had a great season at Lazio. You're mentioning Italy. What about him, for example? Oh, yeah, I think he's got a great job. But I think maybe the top goal scorer of this will be the person who takes penalties. Does Lukaku take penalties for Belgium? Yes. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd go with Lukaku then because I think uh, the top goal scorer, you know, look at Harry Kane, he takes penalties for, for England and they very rarely miss and there will be penalties in this tournament. So I would go with Lukaku if he takes penalties for Belgium. Interesting scenes. Now then, there is, and very kindly uh, provided by our sponsors for the show, Tony Bet, uh, a £100 charity bet. We've got three of them. Now, I've been begging, scraping and pleading like a child in a sweet shop to be allowed one of the charity bets. <laughs> through a complex, through a complex uh, algorithm whereby... I just created enough of a fuss that Emil very kindly stepped aside. Uh, It's myself, Alan and Rushi are going to take aim for charity. So, gentlemen, if you would tell me 
What's your charity selection and for which charity and why? Hmm. Alan McInerney. Rushy, you go. Oh, you want me, me to go? Um, oh, yeah. it's, it's for the Alan McInerney charity, alanmcinerney.com. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. What am I going to go for? What am I going to go for? I mean, the, the goal scorers, I've just I've had a little look at the for the Italian uh, thing. I think it's Giorgini that takes your pens for, for Italy, but I don't think you'd end up top goal scorer. <clears throat> I want to do a qualifying and I'm not going to be popular with Russia, but I think Turkey have a good chance of qualifying. The only thing, I think the rod's on, they're 47, 46 or something. I don't know what the guys are going to give us on it. And I don't know whether that's a, a decent enough or whether I should go for something a little bit more outstanding in terms of winning a game. Come so on, I'm going to have to... Give us, a, give us something at a price. Right, well, in that case, in that case, I'm going to, I've got to go with the top goal scorer. He will be flying at this tournament. Uh, incidentally, when you talked about the speculation about him going somewhere, I saw him actually on a Belgian television programme saying he is definitely staying at Inter Milan. He's spoken to everybody he needs to speak to and he will still be at Milan next year. So he's got nothing to worry about apart from scoring goals for Belgium. So my 100 quid is going on the big man to be top goal scorer and with a bit of luck, we'll get sevens at least. And it's for Headway, a charity. I work for a, a, a children's aid uh, charity in Scotland. That I do quite a lot of work for uh, to help them raise money. And Headway is one of the sort of tributaries within under the umbrella of uh, Children's Aid Scotland. So Headway will be receiving, hopefully, when Lukaku gets seven, eight, nine, ten goals with a bit of luck. There's a great story about this guy called Alan McAnally who played for Aston Villa and the... German management from Bayern Munich came over to watch him in a game and they mm-hmm. summoned him into the office afterwards and they said, Alan, we got the opportunity to come and watch you. We would like you to at least think about the possibility of coming to play for FC Bayern Munich. Mm-hmm. And I have it on good authority that Alan McAnally would have signed the contract there and then, but he said, well, thank you very much for your interest. I'm flattered. But of course, I am still an Aston Villa player and I'd have to talk to the manager so maybe there's a little bit of um, window dressing there from Lukaku. Well, actually, uh, maybe he's already dreaming of his penthouse apartment in Manchester or his house on the King's Road in London. Maybe, yeah. The lads will tell you it's always nice to be, to be wanted by somebody else, but you've got to keep your powder dry. And every now and again, you tell a couple of porkies whether you think, whatever they need to hear, that's what they're going to hear. Um, I, I believe the big man will still be at Inter, uh, which means he's got nothing to worry about. And I'm hoping... That, that hundred quid I've got will be turned into, I don't know, six, seven or eight hundred quid for charity. There is the the wisdom of Mr. McAnally, Romelu Lukaku, top goal scorer at Euro 2020. Right, the spotlight and the the barrel of the assassin's rifle turns upon you, <laughs> Mr. Ian Rush. Can you find the net from 12 yards? Um, this is your chance to net some money for charity. Uh, what's it going to be and why? I think the uh, Clatterbridge Cancer Hospital on the Will, um, no, they've been very uh, good to uh, friends of mine who have been there. So uh, my charity bet will be for the Clatterbridge Cancer Hospital on the Will. Lovely. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to believe that. I've just heard Marcus speak there, right? And I was, I was thinking exactly the same, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> just go for Turkey to qualify then. <laughs> no, I, I think um, it's been difficult. I'm going to go. What price are Italy to win it? Italy, uh, 11s or 12s? Yeah. To win the tournament, I believe are 11 to 1. I'm just double checking here. Uh, yes, indeed. Italy to win Euro 2020 with Tony Bet, 11 to 1. So at a hundred pound stake, including oh. your stake back, that would be 1,200 pounds if the Azuri could do it uh, to the hospice. Forza Italia. Forza Italia <laughs> from Ian Rush. And for my good self, uh, I am, and thank you for the opportunity to do this. Uh, the charity is Rosa Bell's Rooms, uh, who it's a brilliant, intuitive, clever charity. They provide uh, accommodation for families who've got sick children in hospital and couldn't necessarily otherwise find accommodation nearby. So it's a really, really smart and generous charity. And they do some great work. So Rosa Bell's Rooms, hoping to get them a few quid. If Karim Benzema back in the international fold, France, well, the lads have already said goals, goals, goals. So hopefully the French are going to make a nice progress through the tournament, fueled by the goals of Benzema, 
who will win my charity bet, I hope. So Karim Benzema, top goal scorer for me. Lads, we're going to take a little pause there. We'll be back in part two uh, with a number of debates. We're going to get the thinking cap on. We're going to talk about your experiences in tournaments and international football. We're going to talk about the dreaded penalties and some good stories from your playing days. We will be back momentarily. You're very welcome to part two of this bookmakers.co.uk Euro 2020 preview in association with Tony Bet, who I must just add in at this juncture, have got a really good initial sign-up uh, bonus for any new customers depositing in the UK or Ireland. It's a 100% match up to a hundred pounds. A perfect, perfect way perhaps to get involved with Euro 2020 from our sponsors, Tony Bet. Now then, we're talking tournament and international football in part two. And the man I'd like to summon from the changing room, Mr. Emil Heskey. Emil, I'm intrigued about this year's Euros. Obviously, these are strange times we live in, particularly COVID having the impact it's had. We've had a truncated season. We've had little pre-season preparation in the summer of 2020. Now we're leading off the end of a busy campaign, going straight into an international tournament. Um, to what extent is fatigue going to play a, a part in this summer's tournament? How will the players be, be preparing and how would you be dealing with that factor if you were preparing to pull on the England shirt this summer? If you're talking about fatigue, we've got to understand fatigue. Is it, is it mental fatigue or physical fatigue? I mm. wouldn't say physical fatigue. That'd be, uh, but that, that'd be fine. It's more mental. They've come out of a strange, strange season. No fans, which is like training ground games, tough. Uh, and then you're coming out of, of no pre-season as well. So no pre-season is very, very tough. You've got to remember they were going into pre-season and they'll happen to come back in fours. And you're not having your team around you um, to, to really push you on. Um, so there's that. And then you've seen the ups and downs of the season um, as well uh, with, with the likes of when you're looking at, we'll talk about the Premier League, when you're talking about uh, West Ham uh, having a fabulous season, uh, pushing, pushing the top four, pushing for top four. Um, Villa as well were in and around there after the season that they, um, that they were struggling when they first came up. And now look at what they're actually achieving now. Um, so, so physical, physical is not a problem. It's, I think it's more mental. We used to have, I'll tell you how it went. We used to have like a week off after the season. So you actually go away with your family, have that time off, switch off. And then you come back into camp and you're, you're training again. Then you have like a mini preseason to get you going again. And that could be very, very tough because again, no one really likes preseason. So <laughs> no one really likes all that running, but you're getting yourself ready for that actual tournament and, and, You've got to physically and, uh, and, well, more mentally get yourself ready for the games that are in hand and the games are going to come thick and fast. But you're, you're, you're in there for a reason because you're, you're the best and you want to be the best. So you're, or you're obviously pushing yourself and challenging yourself to be the best. And that's where you see who are the best in the, in the group and who are the best in the, in, the, in the tournament. You did that repeatedly. You won 62 England caps. That takes some doing, I would suggest. Um, just cast your mind back. How did the call come? Because in this age of modern communication, you can get a knock on the door. You can get a fax. You can get an email. You can get a text message. Somebody might phone you up. The very first time it came, a young Emil Heskey. Mm -hmm. Just bring us back to that moment where, what was the method of communication? Um, I'm showing my age now. It, was, it would have been fax. Um, fax to the club. And uh, then Where the were you at that time? Which club were you Le in? Leicester, Leicester City. Leicester City, and it would be faxed to um, Leicester City, and um, they would let you know that you've been called up um, when the dates are, and then you'd get a letter. Uh, you'd get the letter, and you'd go through the letter and and, uh, and tell all your family. Um, but then, obviously, over the years, I was lucky enough to go from 2000 to 2010. Um, I went to the uh, Euro 2000, then I went to the World Cup 2010, and then obviously things things would change. You get a, co uh, a phone call or a text message first and foremost before everyone before it before it's all put out. And obviously, you got to keep it under wraps and not tell anyone to to leak it out, like. But uh, so you'd know already that you're in you're involved, etc. I'll, I'll give you a story where um, I was out of the actual to um, the the system for a while. I wasn't in the I wasn't in the actual squads, etc. And uh, Steve McLaren rang me up, but. 
uh, the, the lads will know that when, when, when you get a phone call from a manager, you don't know if it's actually the manager or someone pranking you, one of the lads. So I was actually going to hang up on him. And uh, I'm saying, he goes, oh, hi, Emil, it's Steve. I went, yeah, hi, Steve. And he went, oh, it's Steve McLaren. I went, yeah, hi, Steve. <laughs> because I thought it was one of the lads. I was at Wigan mm -hmm. and I thought it was one of the lads uh, messing, playing games. Then he started talking and I'm like listening. I'm saying, yeah, whatever. And then he goes, he started telling me about Michael. This Michael, I'm like, oh, this is actually, this might actually be Steve McLaren. And it was, and he was calling me back into the actual, uh, in, back into the squad. And I'd been out of the squad for four years. So imagine if I hung up on him. I don't think I would have got back in again. <laughs> Sending the England manager away with a flea in his ear. Unbelievable. Um, talk to me about, so when that call up came, that very first call up, uh, just sticking with that theme, how did you feel? And what's the very first thing you did privately? Did you ring your mum? Did you ring your girlfriend? Did you just pump your fist and think, oh, that's it? I mean, what an accolade to actually, for all the, for all the sacrifice, for all the focus and determination and dedication as a young person, not going out doing the thing that people do, partying and drinking, because that really is, to get to that elite level is something very, very special. And surely the first time, the actual sort of pent up, desire to get to that level how did you react can you take us back to that moment um if i'm gonna be honest it wasn't it wasn't one of the ones that you you, you mentioned there I, I i rang my mom uh, mom and dad went home rang uh went home spoke to them and just told them that i was involved in the i've been called up etc um it's funny because it's hard to explain so i'd played from 16s all the way through so mm. it was the natural progression and i was playing first team football so it was kind of something that I knew that was coming at some stage. So I was prepared for it. And I was more thinking, I wasn't really thinking about the actual, oh, the phone call. I was more thinking about, oh, I'm going to be seeing Ian Wright. Oh, I'm going to be seeing Les Ferdinand. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to kick, uh, I'm going to kick this person. <laughs> I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to uh, shoulder barge that defender. I'm going to, me and Solo are going to have a real good tussle. So these are the things that I'm actually worrying about, not about the actual call up and, 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 and this excitement. I'm, I'm more excited about who can, I, who can I bully? Who can I shoulder barge and push off the ball? Yeah. They're the ones, they're the things that I'm more thinking about. And then, and then oh, can I, can I dink this goalkeeper? Can I take a penalty against? They're more of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about because I'd already actually played during, from the six, like I said, from 16s all the way to the, all the way to that time, the 21s. The next step was actually the first team. So um, I was actually more, I was actually very prepared for it. Oh, listen, that, that's wonderful insight. I love football and maybe that's what separates an elite athlete and somebody who goes to that level who just takes it in their stride and actually says, well, I belong here and I'm going to go and show it. So that is a really fantastic answer. Just one more on this theme because I'll, I'll bring the lads in and you talk about prank calls. I can't imagine that Alan McAnally would ever do such a thing. <laughs> uh, however, when you found the back of the net for England, that in itself... OK, you scored a hatful of goals wherever you went, and that's why fans loved you. But to find the net for England in a major tournament, wow. To actually go to a tournament and then um, eventually, eventually score the euphoria and then have players jumping on your back as well, oh, it's amazing, amazing absolutely amazing feeling. And to have that memory um, to cherish for life is, is great. And then to, for, you, for your kids and then your grandkids eventually to see you See that you've done that, yeah. Amazing, amazing thing. Great answers, Emil. Thank you for now. Uh, Mr. Alan McAnally, um, fresh from trying to bankrupt our sponsors with your charity bet for Headway, um, let's take you back uh, in the day to preparing for a major international game. Um, you're there, obviously there's weight, there's, there's expectation, there's, there's a, a very, very proud and football crazy nation like Scotland they know mm. that Alan McAnally is in danger of starting up front for them. They're thinking, hey, we've got a chance here. Listen, mm. we might be a small country, but we've got quality. Take me back to representing your country for the first time, pulling on that jersey and walking out in front of those, in a good way, crazy fans. You know they're going to be vocal. You know they're going to be absolutely up for it. You don't want to disappoint them. There's pressure there, but surely there must be adrenaline, bit of butterflies, a lot of excitement. You need to have all them, but you need to you need to use it to your best advantage. I mean, I came late to the party because even when I was at Celtic, the likes of Morris Johnson and Frank McIverney and uh, even it was just really after sort of 
Dalglish and Russia knows that you know, the Dalglish days was, when, was really when I got in. And I didn't get into the Scotland team until I was at Aston Villa. Um, and I got the letter and I phoned my dad and nobody was happy. My father was a football player as well, but he didn't get to represent Scotland. And the first, uh, the, the first thing I, I used to think about my grandfather, my grandfather used to take me to the games as well. And I, I kind of thought about him a little bit as well as the excitement of actually thinking, well, I'm going to... And the guys will know this. It was, it was actually, when I think back, one of the most amazing times was the World Cup, regardless of, you know, staying down on the Ayrshire coast and then travelling by bus to Glasgow to Hamden. And the bus can't get into the ground because there's 60, 70,000 people. And the, you've got uh, a, a bike behind, a bike in front, and a, motor, a, a police motorbike away ahead, you know, and they're all changing. And the excitement of even thinking you're going to play for Scotland and going to Hamden is just, it was just amazing. I mean, it was, it was incredible. But I mean, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to really grip that and say, the reason I'm here is because I've done, you know, I'm going to do this. And the guys, thankfully, for the lads, had a much longer international career than I had, because I unfortunately got injured and then I only played, you know, like nine, ten games. But but even those alone were, and to be involved in a in a World Cup was just. It's hard to describe because you think of friends, you think of certainly family, but it was going to the games and realising we are, we everybody knows the, the Tartan army, but when you actually look out the window and you see everybody and you think, oh my God, it's the Tartan army. Your dad, Jackie, was a legend. He won the, he won the league title in, in Scotland with Kilmarnock, no less. Everybody yeah. in that part of Scotland, and your words, not mine, I listened to you in an interview saying everybody, everybody knew Jackie McAnally. I was fortunate to get the genes. Now, eventually, you improve, you mature, your confidence grows, you start hitting a lot of goals, whereupon you find yourself in the international squad. Was that, in some ways, given what you had to try and emulate, the standards you had to try and live up to, was that a natural fulfilment or, Alan... Was it actually a relief to get to that level, given the, the, the weight of expectation behind you as a young player? Uh, no, not a relief. I, I suppose the lads will know this as well. I think everybody expected me to be a football player because of my dad. Yeah. I mean, the good thing is, every time I go back to Scotland, everybody says, you'll never be as good as your father. And I'm like, well, obviously not. He's my dad. I'm never going to be as good as my dad, am I? So you have to put up with the rather... Um, when you come from Scotland and you do okay, don't expect to get a pat in the back because they're all going to bring you down a little bit. But there was an expectancy of me probably to be a football player because of dad. And then obviously getting to the level I got to was just, you know, I, I, no, no, I expected it. The, the last time, you work so hard. You, 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 you dedicate yourself to, you know, your mates are going out on a Friday night and you're like, can't... I mean, I can remember when I was... I was at Air United, I was 18, 19 years old, and I was sitting in the house, and my, my old man had been at a golf or something, he came back, he went, what are you doing? I said, I'm not doing anything. And he went, exactly, out, go for a run, take the dog down the beach. Yeah. And I was like, and obviously, I'm 18, young man. I was like, well, he went, out, go, get your gear on, because I was still living at home, mm. down the beach, do some runs, do, you know, thing with... And I'd be hitting the ball into the, the, the sleepers down the train line at half nine, nine o'clock at night, using the lights off the railway. Because you can see this back in the day, for God's sake, it's 40 years ago. And I always look back to that thinking, I wonder if that gave me advantage on some of the times on a Saturday afternoon when players were getting tired and I was getting stronger. So in terms of his, like, do you want to be a football player? Well, yeah, well, do something about it. And I did. And thankfully, I got to a position where, you know, I can do this, put this on and think, yep, those really were the days. <laughs> they were the really well the days. I mean, they really were. It was just unbelievable. And unfortunately for me, of course, getting injured curtailed my career. But in terms of having the opportunity to play for your country, I'm telling you now, there is nothing better. Rushy scored at the top end, I scored at the top end, and Emil scored at the top end. But when you pull on that Scotland shirt, England shirt, Wales shirt, you can do anything, anything. The cap fits you well, sir. Final question on this section. Um, we talk particularly about the element of fatigue. You said other players were tiring in games. You were getting stronger. 
Um, Emil gave us a brilliant answer about the season that's been. Is it physical fatigue? Is it mental fatigue? However, when you come into this tournament, at the very, very front of this programme, you gave us, you yourself gave us a great answer and you said, I don't think there's going to be a big upset. Belgium, no. Spain, perhaps France. And yet, doesn't the fact, just playing devil's advocate with you for one second, I know you've given your opinion, but I just want to throw it back across the net at you. Doesn't the fact that you've got teams coming in here who've had brutal hard schedules, physically and mentally, not open the door, at least just a crack to suggest that we could get another shock result. Greece in 2004 were 100 to 1. Nobody mm. in the world, not even people in Greece. Greece brought great support that tournament. I was in Portugal. I went to both the semi-finals, And you're watching, they couldn't believe it. They were in absolute dreamland. Didn't they go and win it? Surely there has to be at least a sporting playful chance that something very odd is going to happen. These guys are not machines. They're athletes. They can't just go and go and go. No, you're right. I mean... It'd be nice if there was another country that had an auto rehaggle that actually took Greece to that title. That'd be unbelievable. Um, I just, I don't, I just think these lads at the top end are just extraordinarily good. We spoke, you know, briefly about Lukaku and Bappe, Griezmann, Immobile, uh, Memphis Depay, all these ones that are expected to do well, including England, incidentally, and I throw in Foden and Kane and Grealish and Mount. And it has been a difficult season. I mean, you've already seen what we have seen, Lee, actually, is, is, is Tom Rather, is, is the fact that there's been injuries towards the end of the season. And there's not just England and Scotland, but we are waiting for, you know, another 10 days to see if someone's going to be fit to play in it. I think the mental fatigue, I think the boys will be okay because I think they've got a little space between times to get themselves ready to rock and roll. And once it starts, your adrenaline pulls you through anyway. It's your injuries you don't want to get. But, I mean, I, I, you're right, Neil did speak about a fatigue. There isn't that domestic game to get to the end. But when you get the letter or the text or whatever and somebody says you're playing for your country, trust me, you'll get a little jag of, jag of energy to try and get you to a position where you want to just be starting, not just in the squad. Great answer. Um, on we go. Thanks for now, Alan. On we go to you, Ian. Um, can I ask you this and frame it this way, if I may? Um, you obviously had this astonishing record of goal scoring and appearances for Liverpool Football Club. Um, however, was it equally good or perhaps even better when you pulled on the red jersey of Wales? I think you've come to me last year on purpose, haven't I? Because I haven't <laughs> qualified for major tournaments. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, uh, yeah, I think you're right. When you when you pull on that jersey, uh, my first time was actually made my debut against Scotland in uh, 1980, 81. And, uh, you know, I couldn't believe it. It was absolutely, um, I'm so proud, you know, my dad being a, a very, very big Welshman and everything to represent your country for your first time was, uh, was something special. So Mike mm -hmm. England was a manager and... Uh, I think Ian Walsh got injured and I, I remember getting warmed up and I, I didn't know how to warm up. And Kevin Ratcliffe was on the bench saying, look as if you're interested. <laughs> that, so, so I just wanted to get on the pitch and uh, I just went on the pitch and uh, it was absolutely great to say, I've actually say now I've played for my country. It's something really, really special. And again, it, it was completely different to Liverpool. Liverpool, I would have maybe five or six chances, where Wales, maybe only one or two chances. And that was the difference. I had to take my chances uh, for Wales because uh, when I played for Liverpool, I know I'd have three or four or five chances. But Wales was different. It was a, a lot harder. And, and funny enough, in a lot of the times, uh, as I'd to tell you, some of the uh, club managers didn't want you to go and represent your country mm -hmm. because you could get injured. Because every time, every time I come back, they said, I'd been working so hard, I, I was no good for Liverpool the following Saturday. You know, and they, they were trying to say, oh, no, don't go say that you're injured. But mm. I was so proud of being um, a Welshman. I, oh, every time I could, I turned up for my country. Well, you absolutely did because you're very modest as well, Ian. You scored 28 goals for Wales, which for a team that didn't thrive upon creating chances for you is an astonishing record, really, and puts you second to Gareth Bale. Uh, in, the, in the international Welsh goal scoring ranks. So that in itself is some achievement. Same question that I touched upon both with Emil and Alan. Um, going back to 1980, what was it? Smoke signals, carrier pigeon. How did you find out that that call up was coming? Because I love this idea that 
football must be the only industry in the universe where fax machines are still relied upon. You hear about, for example, the famous David De Gea non-transfer to Madrid in 2015. In what other circumstance do you still have these antiquated faxes going around? Uh, how did you find out that you were actually going to be selected to play for Wales? Well, there wasn't fax machines in my days then, was there? <laughs> so I think it was me. Really, I got told it was the newspapers, really. They were the one telling me, they said, my, I've played for Chester. And uh, I'm actually made my debut for Wales before Liverpool. So I was at Chester and uh, Mike England, the Welsh manager, came to watch me. And a few of the press there were saying, oh, he's going to put you in the squad and everything. And it was just after the game, he came down to see me in the, in the dressing room. He said, I'm going to put you in the, in the squad for, for Wales. You know? So Mike England was the one, when I was playing for Chester after the game, came and told me. Good stuff. Right. I don't think, at least this is my, uh, maybe you're good at disguising it and hiding it. I don't think Ian Rush has ever been nervous about anything in his entire life. I think you're just a natural. Therefore, while I've got you, I'm going to keep you and we're going to move on to the dreaded penalty kicks. When you were given that ball and you're making that slow trudge up to spot the ball, referees checking it's on the spot, keepers there trying to put you off, maybe a few little words, perhaps the fans are behind the goal waving at you, jeering at you, maybe even throwing a few little missiles and bits and pieces and you're doing whatever mental strategies and techniques it takes to try and just make sure that you block all of that out. How did you feel? Did the pressure ever come to you? Are you actually outwardly thinking, OK, look, I look strong and positive and confident, but actually underneath all of this, my heart's beating out of my chest, my legs feel weak, and I'm thinking, oh, please let this be over, and somehow it's going to go in. How did that go for you on the international stage particularly? I, I think from, from my point of view... Um... I never took penalties. I think on my, my 346 goals, yep. well, I, only, I only scored four penalties. I preferred to hit a moving ball than having a dead ball. And it's, mm. it's weirdly enough. So, I'm, But the only time I did take penalties, I took one in the, the Champions League when we played Rome in 84. Yep. I took one in the semi-final when we beat Portsmouth. And I will tell you the one, I, my experience of taking penalties is that the walk from the halfway line to the penalty spot was most probably the most nervous time of my career because you're by yourself, you have 80,000 people booing at you and you're walking up there, you played 120 minutes game, you feel, you're feeling tired, but your main thing is to put the ball on the spot and hit the target. The most important thing is you hit the target and so many penalties have been missed by people missing the target. So is that it? Back to basics? Yeah, back to basics for me anyway, back to basics there. And I always had one of them where... When you run up to the ball, you can see one eye, the, the goalkeeper. Look, when I took one in the, fi in the final, the goalkeeper went really early. So he made my decision for me. Yep. You know, I just I put it into the, into the right-hand corner. I, I side-foot it into the right-hand corner. And when you score, it, I was the most re relieved man in the world. It was uh, it's um, incredible, the feeling when you score. I mean this question slightly tongue-in-cheek, and it is a bit cheeky, but take it in the spirit it's intended. Even the great Ian Rush didn't take penalties. Is that because you didn't like them and you're thinking, I'd rather give them to someone else? Or was it because, generally speaking, there was a superior spot kick taker in the squad and you thought to yourself, not a problem, I'm happy to let that one go. Even a predator like yourself is going to pass up that opportunity of additional goals. Yes, I think, um, so I remind uh, for Liverpool, Liverpool there, you weren't allowed to take a penalty till the other person had missed. And Phil Neal was a penalty king early Listen. on. Uh, then Jan Moby was the penalty king. And not, they hardly ever missed one. So you didn't have a chance. It was a penalty. He was taking it. And he, I, I'll go as far as back as uh, for Wales in, uh, when we lost to Romania 2-1. You know, it was 1-1. We had a penalty. If we won, we would have went to the USA in 94. And then Paul Bolden was a regular penalty taker. So he was the one that took it. <laughs> now, you can't say I'm taking one now. I think you have to respect the, the penalty taker. And, uh, no, Paul Bolden missed it. You know, we didn't get to the, the World Cup in 94, but it was just one of them where if you had a regular penalty taker, you couldn't take one until they'd missed. Great answer. Very good answer. Uh, Emil, on to you, please, with your England shirt on. Um, England finally got a bit of spot kick glory in the last international tournament. Um, does that exercise those demons? Does that take away all the foibles and all the doubts and all the question marks? Or actually, 
if they suddenly get to spot kicks in one of these vital games this summer in Euro 2020, are all those old fragilities going to resurface? Because let's, let's be honest, it's an elephant in the room. It dogged them throughout international tournaments. It's been a very difficult thing and it's been a heavy weight on many good players' shoulders. What's your experience of that kind of environment with England? And do you think it's now being banished? No, it will always be there. Again, it's something that always follows us around. Um, it's something that media will always throw at, throw at us. It's something that we'll, we'll always be reminded of. But again, you, you've got the opportunity to change that. In 2004, we, um, we had penalties and um, un, un, unfortunately, um, Dry Fussell missed his. And it's, uh, I, like, I think like what she said, it's the, longest, it's, it's the longest and the loneliest walk you'll ever have going to take that penalty at times. And one thing I will say is, um, and you've got to be very confident with it. Um, when you look at the, uh, the penalties that we've, that, that we've taken with England, if you go to the training, you'll see some confident, very, very confident lads. Very, very confident lads that, that will mess about. And you look at the messing about, take it when they're not even looking and stuff like that, and they'll score. But to have fans in the stadium and that pressure on you, suddenly that goal looks like one of those mini goals that you, you're like, where's the actual space that that can actually hit? And it's the pressure that gets you. Um, so again, you've just got to be relaxed, calm, composed, and just go out there and pick a place where you're going to put it and just put it there. And of course, it's not just the supporters in the stadium as well. It's, the, I suppose, the mental burden of knowing that your friends, your family, your partner, all either in the stadium as well, and probably the people sitting around them know that's Emil Lasky, that's his mum, that's his, that's his girlfriend, whatever it might be. Geez, how are they going to react if he scores, if he misses, etc.? Or they're watching on TV, all the people where you grew up, people back, the, the players, the staff, the supporters of, of whichever club you're at at that moment. If you can, drill down even more and tell me you've got the ball under your right arm. Mm -hmm. You're making that eternal trudge from the halfway line, all the players linked up in their arms. The referee's waiting. The opposition goalie's back in the goal. Let's say it's the third penalty. A whole nation is looking at Emil Heskey. You know they're watching. Mm -hmm. Your entire career, you've been focused, dedicated, prepared. And yet, you've talked about those nerves that resurface. What exactly are you feeling at that moment? Is it your heartbeat? Is it your breathing? Uh, is it just your focus? Are you trying to enlarge the, the goalposts in your mind? Are you thinking of where the goalie dived in the last game? What's going on there? Well, the thing is, all that, all the above, again, uh, you would con obviously concentrate on your breathing because you want to be relaxed as possible. Um, you would have done your homework on where the goalkeeper dives, where he's actually good at diving, where he makes most of the majority of his saves. And then you would actually then focus on yourself. Uh, like you're saying, walking up, it, it'll be more about your breathing and keeping as relaxed as possible because you've got to get a good, firm connection on that ball. Because again, if you get a good connection on the ball, nine times out of ten, that goalkeeper will not save that ball. Especially if you hit the corners. Um, I think they say top corners um, and even the bottom corners. Anywhere middle, it's easy for them to actually get and then all they have do is put their arm out. But if you get down low... It's diff some, difficult for the taller ones to get down low. And if you get high, it's difficult for the leap as well. So as long as you hit them corners, and we've seen it time and time again where people are hitting corners and the goalkeeper looks like he's just about to get there and can't make it. So again, it's all about relaxing, um, keeping that breathing. Because again, when you start to get nervous, your breathing goes, you, you get tense, and then you just, you fluff your lines. Excellent, excellent answer. Really fantastic insight because... For, the, for the, the laymen such as myself, you can only begin to imagine what that must feel like. Uh, Alan McAnally, it is your <laughs> time to pay the penalty in this bookmakers.co.uk Euro 2020 preview. Um, penalty kicks, all, all part, of the, part of the job, something you took in your stride, or did you, on the occasions that you ever stood up, did you feel the pressure? Yeah. Uh, the only thing is, and uh, uh, probably Russia will remember this. I don't know so much about Emil, but if you were a left footer, that seemed like, oh, he's got a great left peg on him. He takes the pens. And I was like, hang on a minute. And I think I took two at Air United one day and I scored, but I was only 17, 18. But we had other 
players better. I went to Celtic and we had Roy Aitken, Brian McClare, Paul McStay, Mark, um, Mark, I can't remember his, his thing the name now, and, and, and Tommy Burns. And I'll tell you one great story. We played Motherwell in the semi-final League Cup. We were 2 0 up and we were absolutely cruising. The mother got a goal back and they got another one really late on. Extra time we couldn't score goes to pens. David Hayes, the manager, and he's going round there with me and I'm thinking, I'm definitely taking one because we've made changes, etc. So he gets obviously your main men, Mug Stay and Tommy Bonds and Big Roy and um, um, Brian McClare. And I mean, I'm not getting in front of them. So I'm number six. I am number six to take a pen. We need to score our fifth penalty to get to the final and Tommy Bonds, God rest him, he's not here anymore. He's got to score or I'm taking the sixth penalty. And it was the only, I mean, genuinely, when the, even when we're going through, we, when you want to pass somebody or, you, or you're going in and the ball's coming across and we, we, we can make a finish, we're not thinking about our mum, our dad, our family, the fans. We're concentrating so much. But that walk from there to the penalty spot makes your mind go crazy. It makes your mind go crazy. Thinking about, oh, what, you know, this is ridiculous things. Rather than when the ball comes over, I don't have any time to finish. It's an instinct thing and we score goals. And Tommy Burns scored and I was the most relieved man <laughs> in the whole of, whole of Hamden. It was unbelievable. I was like, mm. no, I can't. If Tommy, I don't even know if I could have walked up, to be honest. I, I, was, I was that like, and it kind of gets you like that. And Emil makes a great point. When you're training and the lads are actually giving it, left foot and they're actually right footed and they're scoring penalties all over the place and then on the Saturday afternoon somebody takes a pen and you're like he doesn't look as confident as he did on Thursday morning when we were practising oh. and that's what it's like that's just what it's like and it's a special kind of person that can keep his composure and, and hit the ball cleanly which I always think is a good thing don't get smart don't lean in don't be too clever hit the ball cleanly just cleanly and then you'd be really surprised if the, if the goalkeeper saves it. And the problem was, even at Aston Villa, we had David Platt, Stuart Gray. I still wasn't in the line to take them because it wasn't really in my time, well, not in my time, certainly that strikers were the designated penalty taker. And I went to Bayern Munich. Listen, I wasn't even in the top 15 because we, we had Olaf Ton. Franz Beckenbauer once said, if I phoned Olaf Ton at four in the morning to say we need a penalty, he'd be like, okay, boss, no problem. So, seriously, I don't even know how far down the line in, in Munich I was for taking a pen. And I took one when we played in a pre-season game, which I scored, thankfully. But I was never asked to take one in one of the real games because I was so far down the line. It is a quite a specialised thing to make sure you hit the target. But there will always be, always, that opportunity for the best in the world not to score. In fact, who am I thinking of right now? Rushy, Emil, help me out here. Italy. Mr. Penn, Roberto Baggio, wasn't it in America? USA 94, yes, indeed. If he can miss a penalty, then anything's possible. Trust me, you don't want to be number six taking a penalty, thankfully. Your word is not mine. Alan, anything is possible. You gave us, a, Emil gave us a wonderful answer about the psychology of England and their penalties and the problems mm -hmm. they've had. Let's say second game of Euro 2020, this summer forthcoming, Scotland, England, Wembley Stadium, 90 minutes, deadlock. 120 minutes, deadlock. Pen, <clears throat> upcoming. Just, if you will, transfer your mindset to those England players. They've got everything to lose. The Scots, they've already come through two shootouts just to get there. They've already <laughs> held England to a draw this Friday night. Uh, those supporters that are in the ground have probably got a raucous atmosphere. They're, they're thinking, we've got nothing to lose. We've got everything to gain. Mm. Those England players are going to be going through the absolute ring around there. Yet another penalty shootout. There's still a little bit of a uh, something in the background there that's a bit of a, a kink in their psychology that has to be a weight. Even if none of them have ever been involved in those unsuccess unsuccessful shootouts, England and penalties, problem? Yeah, big problem. And I think Emil said it spot on. There's a... There's a history with England and penalties, especially against the Germany one. Was it the Russia one? You were saying how you beat Russia, wasn't it? I think it was, which helped. But I go right back to a player I used to love as well was Stuart Pearce, and he managed to, to kill the demons. But you go back to the problem that England have had winning games on penalties. We were brilliant at penalty Scotland. We were absolutely brilliant. We really were. And by the way, John McGinn, 
I'm, a, I'm giving him the ball right now. Not a problem. Not a problem. Even McTominay. Scott's put the brilliant in Manchester United. Brilliant with confidence. Not a problem. There will be in the back of England's players' minds, because they grew up with all this, remember, that they don't want to be part of, you know, missing a penalty if it would come to that. And of course, Gareth, I think Gareth missed a pen as well, didn't he, for, for England at one point and maybe the Euros. So it's, it's there or thereabouts. But listen, I don't think you want to dwell too much in that. I mean, if I was a manager, yeah, practice your pens. But the bottom line is we can have a little conversation about it, but I'm not dwelling it for the players' minds. I don't want them to be thinking about that. There's plenty of time for us to think about it when it, when it happens. But there's certainly going to be more pressure on England than there is in Scotland, that's for sure. OK, moving it on. Um, I've effectively got two more questions for all three of you, if I may, please. I, I know you told me that it was only a scattering of Scotland appearances, proud though they were. Um, and you might very well say Hampden Park for the reasons already given. But what would you say was the, either the best or indeed the most hostile or intimidating or just captivating audience and indeed atmosphere that you experienced at international level, Alan? Uh, well, Hamden was brilliant. I mean, OK, we, we had in Italy, we played at, uh, in Genoa, where Genoa and Sampdoria play. We played Costa Rica, we played Sweden, and then we went to Rome to play Brazil. And there weren't... It wasn't like a bad atmosphere because we had most of it, after all, Tartan Army's there. We've got most of the fans there anyway. They're on our side. That brings its own pressures, of course, et cetera, et cetera. But there was one where I remember we played and it was only in Cyprus and the part, honestly, the pitch was like the M6. It was it was so hard and so bouncy. It was coming off, bouncing all over the place. And we won 3-2 and we scored in the 97th minute. And it was it was like the, the city was full, and it was like I don't know eighty five degrees because the game was still at five six seven o'clock at night, and that was pretty hostile. Genuinely, I mean I know it's only Cyprus, but in terms of the international games, obviously playing a, a, a tournament is just amazing. Driving to the stadium, amazing. But in terms of hostility, I was quite lucky. I didn't really get too too many. Um, against me obviously domestically pick a weekend but in terms of the, the the scotland appearances i had i was quite lucky in terms of normally there was more scotland fans and away fans and it, i would maybe say then what Yugos, the old yugoslavia we went there i think gordon judy scored we went one up and we could beat three one and um, that was that was pretty bad they were they were pretty hostile towards us yugoslavia that's a long time that'd be 19 1991 or something like that. So it was a long time ago. But you can imagine them loving the football. They had a good team at the time with the likes of Prosinetsky and Stojkov, etc., etc. But I would say maybe Yugoslavia. That was um, good to get there, but even better to get out. I'll say so. Uh, Ian Rush, same comment to you. Uh, when you were pulling on a Welsh shirt, what was the, either the best or the most hostile, memorable atmosphere, occasion, stadium that you found yourself playing in and why? I think... Um... When we played for Wales originally in 1980 81, we were playing all our games at Wrexham, and no, uh, because that was in the north of Wales, and it was uh, <clears throat> only held um, 19,000, 20,000, and that was great. Then, for some reason, in the mid 80s, they moved it to Cardiff, and it was Cardiff Arms Park, it's a principality now. But the uh, <clears throat> but now, when you get a full house, we've, we've seen it in rugby get a full house, but we've never seen it in football. We're saying you can get a full house of 20,000 at Wrexham, but if you go to Cardiff Arms Park, if you've only got 20, 30,000, it would look empty. But mm -hmm. when we went there, it was a full house. And the, we beat Germany, you know, where they just changed from West Germany to uh, total Germany. We beat Germany 1 0, and I scored the goal. It was at absolute, I think, 1989 90. And it was absolutely made the, the atmosphere there was something I'll never, ever forget. It was a full house, and it was like a rugby game. And all the fans, the Welsh fans got behind the, the team, you know, made us better to be the world champions. It was absolutely incredible. That was uh, the best for me, without doubt. And uh, about the most hostile, I most probably say Georgia, because we went over there. We actually we got beat 5 0. And we were wondering why we got beat 5 0, even though they were a decent side. But the, it was the it was the hostile thing was uh, really, really. It's the only time I've seen Neville Southall have a bad game, you know, and and he actually, I think Neville now blames it on the crowd. You know, they were right on us and all, right at us and all that. So, 
And like Matt has said, no, that was one of them where we were glad to get out of Georgia. So that was most probably the worst. Of course, of course. Superb. Uh, Emil, um, to yourself as well, in terms of your recollections of pulling on the England shirt, whether you were home or away, the best, the worst, the most hostile, the most intimidating, anything that stands out in your mind that you uh, thought, wow, that was an experience for good or bad. Well, the, the best, obviously, for actually playing against Scotland, um, we, actually, we lost the game, but the actual um, the atmosphere and the environment was just brilliant. And it was like the old Wembley, and this is where we, we lose a little bit sometimes when changing. And the old Wembley was just fantastic. And even though we had the running track and yet you used to have to walk from one end and all the way to the other end, it felt like everyone was on top of you. But now it doesn't have that feeling anymore. And I don't know if it was the Twin Towers or whatever it was. Coming to the game, you're seeing a sea of white and, you know, seeing all the fans and then you're, you're driving through them, etc. And then uh, getting on that pitch and the pitch is just absolutely huge. Um, but that, I think that was one of the best atmospheres that I'd ever been around. Obviously, the playing at, uh, in, in, in Germany and winning 5-1, that was a, a ridiculous atmosphere as well. But... At Wembley, that was that Scotland game was just amazing. Even though we lost the game, uh, and then away hostile probably Turkey, um, and it was weird for me. It's just going to. I'm used to having playing football matches, and you're seeing uh, you're seeing the cop or uh, behind the goal or something. That, that's quite hostile there, and then you're seeing family areas, aren't you? Where well, this was just the whole stadium was just hostile, just grown men screaming at you, and then they had these big speakers on the side of the pitch that were bellowing out, that making it even louder. Uh, and then they just tried to kick all sorts of lumps out of you. Um, but did it was that, good. Good Emil, did that spill over above and beyond actually just, uh, in, just a little bit match in terms of, did you have supporters outside the hotel making a noise, trying to disrupt your sleep no. the night before the game, anything like that? No, no, no. We, we, to be fair, we've never had that, but we, we had a little bit of trouble in the, in the, um, in the tunnel, and that was a uh, very eventful. Uh, when you say a little bit of trouble, I'm sure it all turned out to be a terrible misunderstanding. But exactly, uh, <laughs> professionals doing what professionals do. The, the, the fans outside the hotel wouldn't have bothered Russia and I because we weren't in at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were actually yeah. pushing our way back into the hotel through the crowd, giving it make as much noise as you want anyway. <laughs> I think that um, I seem to, I seem to remember a uh, another one of your stories involving involving that, but that's a that is a segue that we'll touch upon another time, I'm sure, Alan. Um, lads, I'd really like to ask you just finally, and I'm going to stick with Emil on this one to launch it off. Any particular kind of unusual or quirky or funny stories that you can remember from your international days? And I guess there are two bits, Emil. I'd like to just quiz you on, if I may, please. And Maybe nothing sticks. Maybe you'll have a good insight into this. But you mentioned at the front of the conversation that the talisman for the team so long for England was David Beckham. I remember during Germany 2006, he was under the weather and it was a game in which he scored against Ecuador. Um, he, scored a, he scored a dead ball against Ecuador. Mm -hmm. But I remember him actually. It was so hot and he was really unwell and he actually was sick on the pitch. And you could see he was in real dire straits. And yet such was his total determination and focus to continue that game and captain England to victory. He wouldn't come off. And you could see them saying, the physios, the medics, whoever the guys are in the tracksuits on the side, saying, come off, come off. And he's sort of saying, under no circumstances am I leaving this field. Do you remember that? Uh, I, I, was, I actually wasn't in that tournament, but um, I do remember the game. Um, and this is, that's David Beckham through and through, you know. He puts, his, he puts his, his body on the line for the team and he was fantastic for, for England and a great leader in, in that as, as well, you know. I'll give a funny story about, that, uh, about him, actually. And I think Alan was talking about um, coming to the stadium, having police and, and following us around and etc. So we would go for walks um, because you want to you get out of the hotel and you want to just... Um, you want to just... You can't just sit in a hotel for six weeks and, and expect the lads to be... All, all at it. So we'd go for walks and we'd go to the mall or we'd go somewhere. And um, we'd take six security guards with us. Four would walk around Bex and two for the rest of us. 
that's how we put, that's how that's how big he was. We used to have we used to have um I think it was the 2002 we had um probably about 2 to 300 fans watching us train and they all had the all had the different haircuts that he chose. It was absolutely crazy to have that um, Beckham mania in, uh, in uh, Japan. Well, I do seem to remember that around about that point in time when, when your um, correspondent had slightly more hair than I do now, I too was one of those supporters. So <laughs> that is a, a tragic, but nonetheless totally true admission. Rushi, anything good from your international days that you remember standing out as a bit of a, an unusual happening? You said about the Georgian fans trying to intimidate the players there where... Neville Southall was thrown off his stride. Any other uh, bounces from your career? Um, <clears throat> I think what I remember is that um, I used to always room with Kevin Ratcliffe, you know, and uh, we were like big rivals, you know, Liverpool, Everton. And yeah, all. yeah. <clears throat> we, we used to room together. And when we played for Wales, it was brilliant. So we were just talking and we said that what we would do um, next time we play, we made a pack, you know, um, Ras before the game. It was absolutely stupid. We'd just do this. Nanu, Nanu, just before the game started. So we said, we have to do that. We made the pact to do that. So we played on the Wednesday and on the Saturday, it was liverpool Everton game. So just before kickoff, he, he, Rats wasn't looking. So I, shout, I shouted at him and I just went like that. Nanu, Nanu, then he'd done it back. But you should have seen the look on Peter Reid's face. He was looking, <laughs> what the hell is going on here, by the way? So you, you're thinking, what's that? And I thought, oh, Rats is me mate. I swear to God, after two minutes, he just went, <laughs> he just slashed me from behind. <laughs> he said, that's for, that's for get, making me do that before. It was absolutely, <laughs> Kevin Ratcliffe, every five or 10 minutes we played against him, he'd boot you. So I used to say to him, Rats, why did you boot me? He said, the referee, he said, um, he won't book you in the first 10 minutes, I promise you. So he, he was getting away, but you've you got no chance in today's football, have you, about doing that? But uh, Ratsu would always do that and he'd get, away, he'd get away with murder. But I managed to get him back on that, that little thing with uh, Peter Reid still uh, talks about that now. <laughs> Who needs friends? Who needs friends? Uh, which leads us very neatly onto our good friend, Mr. Alan McAnally. Um, cast your mind back. Any, any, any unusual instance, anything to uh, stir the senses that you look back through the... Uh, chapters of representing Scotland on your travels, uh, moving around any of the characters, any of the faces, any of the incidents that stick in your mind, Alan? I think we could sit here for four hours if the lads and I would talk about some of the things that actually really happened. Um, the, 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 gosh, I mean, there's, I'll give you two, one really quick one. And he was one of the, bit, I mean, we grew up together at Air United. Uh, he went to Liverpool, I went to Celtic. A guy called Stevie Nicol. And, <laughs> And Rushy, I mean, there's been numerous amount of stories about Sosh, Stevie. Um, and, but this is a good one. So we, we, he used to eat crisps all the time. He used to eat crisps all the time. <laughs> and we, you, you, you know, the, the, the bags we used to get. So there, there were you know, the big, big bags, all your kit you get, you take your boots and all that. And st- we get to, I can't remember where we're going. We're going to maybe the Yugoslavia trip or somewhere going. And Stevie's bag was going... All the time. And we were like, what the hell have you got in your bag? And it arrived, honestly. And he had like 50 bags of crisps and like two T-shirts and one pair of football boots in, in his bag. And you went into his room and there was crisp packets everywhere. And he still used to eat, obviously, with the team, team meals and pre-match and all that. And he did, used to carry these things. And his bag was always full of crisps. And I know it might not hard for him, but when I look back now, I think, what a God's name are you doing, Stevie? It's unbelievable. The diet, the diet of an elite athlete. There's a famous one of myself. I used to room with Ali McCoy, and as obviously there's there's one particular room, and the boys will know everybody has to go through before anything's allowed to happen. So Coy and I would have a look at it and say, okay, yeah, you can do that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there was one day, Andy Gorham, the goalkeeper, great goalkeeper for Rangers, just phenomenal. But we had Jim Layton, Andy Gorham, and uh, Big Brian Gunn was the three goalies. And Andy hurt his back. And we're in this beautiful hotel. And again, like Emil said, there's guns that were guys with the guns. And the guy that looked after us used to carry a, a book with an elastic band around it. And we were always like, ah, you got a gun in there. You got a gun in there. And he's like, no, don't touch, don't touch the book. And we're like, come on, let us see. And he took the thing and he opened it up and there was a gun inside. And we were like, oh my God, I've never actually seen a gun properly. 
And they were properly like all over the place. Nobody could get in. So we're on this balcony in the pools downstairs. And Roxburgh, Andy Roxburgh, the manager, said, look, by all means, have a bit of a swim, but don't be in there for long. It's warm. You know, stay in the shade, drink lots of water, etc." We were playing hearts in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, this little balcony. And a couple of lads were getting massages because we're in the shade you know, to stay out in the sun. And we heard this doing, doing, splash. And we're thinking... Who's in the pool? We're told not to go in the pool. Doing, doing, splashes. Some of the water's starting to come up as the, as the splash is getting even harder. We look over the top and Gorob, Andy, sore back, don't go in the pool. He's on this springboard, bouncing as hard as he can, launching himself into the water to splashes all the water up onto the balcony. I mean, I mean we were like... How's that back, Andy? He's like, that's ah, okay now. I'm trying to get you as wet as you possibly can. And honestly, you were like, seriously, children, sorry. Great days, just great days. Great days, great recollections. Um, the three of you, magnificent, absolutely wonderful. I have to say, I really wish this could go on for another two hours and perhaps we will reconvene and do it all another day. But a massive thank you on behalf of our sponsors, Tony Bet, and for everybody watching, uh, from myself, from Emil, from Ian, from Alan, uh, this has been uh, the bookmakers.co.uk Euro 2020 preview. It's been nothing but a pleasure and it tees us up very nicely for the big ticket, which is, of course, uh, the Euros this summer, beginning on the 11th of June. For one month, uh, whoever prevails, let's hope that thanks to the generosity of our sponsors, we can get a few quid for charity via those charity bets. And in the meantime, settle down and enjoy. It's going to be a great month. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.